textbooks are going to tell you kids that you have an appendix that is vestigial. You don't need it anymore. That's a lie. You need your appendix. The appendix is part of your immune system. The preacher is way too casual in his accusations of lies. In this case, we're talking about a hypothesis. Remember that the purpose of science is to improve understanding. And one way to do that is to seek out the flaws in your current perception and correct them. You can't do that if you think that your current belief is already the absolute truth beyond all correction and that it cannot even be questioned. A science encourages you to question all assumptions as well as authorities, to winnow fact from falsity, and one way is to devise hypotheses. Maybe this is how it works, and if I'm right about that, then future discoveries or experiments should reveal X, but not Y. If they find Y, then I got some or all of it wrong and have to start over. Darwin made a number of hypotheses that if evolution is true, then we should discover this and also this, but not that. And he got most of them right. But he didn't get everything right. For example, he tried to understand how heritable units of information were being passed from both father and mother to be expressed in the variety that was then found in the offspring. That one he couldn't figure out. He came up with what he called gemules, a hypothetical system, and he said, maybe this is how it works. Then a few years later, an Augustinian monk named Gregor Mendel, farming peas in what is now the Czech Republic, solved Darwin's dilemma with his discovery of the rules of inheritance. But that meant that genetics was the real explanation and that gemules were the wrong answer. That doesn't mean that gemules were a lie, because Darwin didn't make the definite assertion that this is how it is, as if it's a faith-based religious belief. Instead, he made the suggestion that maybe this is how it works, and if so, then yada yada. That is not lying. I've noticed that dogmatic religious believers don't seem to have the ability to think hypothetically, so I will explain. If you propose a hypothesis, you should determine how to test it. You can't prove it right. That's against the rules. You can only show whether it is supported. If it is not supported, then it is effectively the same thing as being wrong. All hypotheses should be testable and potentially falsifiable, meaning that there must be some way to show if it's wrong or not supported as compared to what is supported. Because how else are we going to know if we're on the right track? Science works like a game of 20 questions where each query is a hypothesis to be tested to find out whether it is supported or not. Thus, the more of these answered questions we have, the closer we hone in on the truth, stripping away falsity as we go. And one of the things that this preacher will not admit is that we have numerous examples of diminished limbs or organs that uh, no longer serve the original function and are in the process of being lost. The appendix is a little spindly bit attached to the large intestine, and it does look like a remnant shriveling up to eventually disappear altogether. And sometimes it causes a problem in becoming painfully inflamed to the point that it might kill you, and this has been and still is associated with its inactivity. And Darwin also knew that only certain herbivorous mammals had this feature, so he hypothesized that the human appendix might be the evolutionary remains of a structure called a cecum, which is larger in basal primates and thus, theoretically, in our extinct ancestors also. And this would have helped our predecessors ingest tougher, more infectious foods. And Darwin thought that the organ fell into disuse once we started cooking most foods, and subsequent studies for more than a century fell in line with that hypothesis which is why the textbooks read as they did. Here's an article on the web from University of Chicago. Ask a scientist. Nancy writes in and says, what is the function of the appendix in a human before it is taken out through surgery? This lady writes back and says, the appendix has no known function. It, she's way behind the times on that one. While this preacher normally cites sources that are decades out of date, he is here, surprisingly, referring to what was then brand new information, not even in the press yet. We now know that rather than being a vestige of the cecum, the appendix has evolved multiple times, once in Australian metatherians, marsupials, and again separately in liars, rodents, lagomorphs, and basal primates too, which is why we have them. In fact, 70% of primate and rodent families have this feature, including some that still have a robust cecum, and the appendix grows out of that. Darwin couldn't have known about that in 1859. If he did, he wouldn't have posed his hypothesis. She goes on to say, It is believed that the appendix will gradually disappear in human beings as our diet do not include cellulose no more.
our diet do not include cellulose no more. <laughs> University of Chicago, wow, good place to get an education. Uh, not in English, apparently. But in the first place, this is not true, okay? The appendix is part of your immune system. Biologists like William Parker of Duke University now theorize that this loss of function, which is linked to appendicitis, more likely results from drinking purified water from sanitary sewage treatment. And more importantly, he has also recently indicated what may be a primary function. You see, the majority of your cells in your body are not your own. You are mostly bacteria, a symbiont whose survival depends on the microbes living in your digestive tract. Some diseases like dysentery or cholera may flush the system, leaving us in a compromised state, in which case the appendix serves as a bacterial nursery to replenish the flora in your gut. And now scientists believe there are peripheral functions too that Darwin couldn't have known about, a small part of mucosal immune functions and so on. I don't like to say that scientists believe something because some people take that to mean that they merely assumed that for no good reason, when we know that every scientific position must be based on supportive evidence. It's not like scientists are chanting the mantras that we believe this thing about the appendix and you too must swear to believe this thing about the appendix. No. Science is completely opposite of that, where blasphemy and heresy against the status quo are the way to challenge and correct bad science. So instead of saying that the scientists believe, let's say the scientists now suspect. The appendix activates killer B cells like your thyroid activates killer T cells. It is true that the appendix is no longer considered to be the vestigial organ that Darwin thought it was. And soon after the preacher's sermon, there were studies published by professional scientists showing that it's time to change the textbooks. And high school textbooks like this one already have been changed accordingly so that they don't refer to the appendix as vestigial anymore. So let's recap on the preacher's list of supposed lies in the textbooks so far. And note that Grand Canyon evidently was made by the Colorado River. The geologic column really does exist. Stratigraphy is dated both relatively and absolutely, objectively, with radioisotopes, not circular reasoning. Several species of lobe-fin fish are still alive, but we never said they were all dead, nor that they needed to be, nor did any scientist ever say we evolved from coelacanths. We have multiple lines of evidence proving that geologic layers definitely are different ages, and there is ample evidence that plants and animals are related. Evolution really is a theory of biodiversity, just like all the textbooks say, and that theory only pertains to biology, not to any other theory of physical, chemical, or cosmic origins. Natural selection is one of the mechanisms of evolution. The peppered moths really are evidence of that. They were not a hoax. Homology really does imply common ancestry, with no hint of a common designer anywhere involved, nor even possible. Pharyngeal clefts are gill slits since they develop into gills in fish, and no one ever promoted abortion by saying that the fetus isn't human. I went through all of these and systematically showed the facts proving that evolution is the only answer that can account for all of this and that creationism can't account for any of it. So when this preacher posts what he thinks are rebuttals to this series, he plays maybe 5% of my video and then insults me just calling me names. And he keeps repeating the same errors uncorrected, like when he said that evolution is a change in kinds, because that's all he can do. He cannot present the facts that show that he's right, because he's not. We're just supposed to believe him because he says so. I can show the facts to back me up, to show the truth of my position where he cannot, because there is no truth to his position. With this one caveat, if the preacher's alleged 13th lie in the textbooks was that the appendix is not vestigial, then I would have to here concede the point and admit that this would have been the only thing he got right in the whole series. But that's not what he said. Instead, he said that the 13th point on his list was that there are no vestigial organs, which of course there are many such examples in every animal family, including our own. So in this one instance where he actually could have been right, the preacher still managed to snatch defeat right out of the jaws of victory. Thus, he still has a perfect record of complete failure. It's true you can live without your appendix. That's true. You can live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes and both your ears also. Doesn't prove you don't need them. If you take your appendix out, you got a much better chance of getting all sorts of diseases. The problem here is a definitional fallacy, not to be confused with the appeal to definition fallacy, which is different. This is nearly the opposite of that, wherein the definition is a straw man, a logical fallacy that misdefines the term being discussed, so that discussion becomes equivocation, another logical fallacy, wherein the meaning changes as necessary to move the goalposts, which is yet another logical fallacy. 
and the preacher uses the definitional fallacy often. He has redefined evolution in such a way that no science text ever written would agree with him, and additionally, his definitions contradict what all the textbooks really do say. He has also redefined natural selection so that he doesn't have to admit what that really is. He redefined religion so that he can pretend that every belief is just another faith, the tu quo qui fallacy of false equivalence, and he has redefined what vestigial means. The colloquial definition is something that is shrunken, shriveled, or reduced. For example, humans have exactly the same dentition as all other apes, the only difference being size. Our molars are identical to that of gorillas or the extinct paranthropines, except that ours are smaller and weaker because we don't eat foods as tough as they do or did. Our jaws are smaller and weaker too, such that sometimes there's no room for that third molar or wisdom tooth. And that's not a problem for me because I have a big mouth, obviously. But in other people, those teeth can get impacted, leading to morbidity and potentially death unless surgery is performed. Now, people with a certain Pax9 mutation don't have to worry about that because they never grow the third molar. That's evolution adapting to the new jaw size. Beyond that, biologists usually apply a secondary criteria that the vestigial trait is not just diminished, but that it also doesn't have the same original function anymore. Our molars still perform the same original function, even if it is in a diminished capacity. So apart from the wisdom teeth in some mouths, our molars are not vestigial, but our canines are. No one has canines pronounced enough to be used for stabbing and holding prey. Our bite would cut with our incisors first. And we know that since the time of the cynodonts, fangs were the dominant teeth, and remnants of them still appear as atavisms in other mammals that have lost them. An atavism is an evolutionary trait that was lost and comes back when that gene is activated again, but the trait is still vestigial. For example, even horses sometimes still grow canines, even though they don't serve any function in the horse. And this is a fact that only makes sense in light of evolution, in which creationism cannot explain. Among other apes, other monkeys, fangs are also used as sexual displays or in competition with other males. But the fangs of men are just as small and pathetic as in women. And apart from some supernatural sex pots and movies, no humans have fangs long enough or sharp enough to either intimidate other men or to impress the ladies anymore. Vestigial traits don't have to be utterly useless, only that they don't perform the same original functions anymore. They could have been adapted to a different purpose, and we'll see examples of that later in the series. Although our canines aren't even used for chewing. We might bite with incisors, cuspids, or molars, but never with our canines. So they don't serve any function at all anymore. And that's how the preacher wants to define vestigial organs, as traits that are useless and don't have any function whatsoever. And there are a few other animals that really do have such utterly useless traits as remnants of their evolution from more generalized forms. Uh, look at the peripheral toes of Merichippus that don't even touch the ground anymore. They're still susceptible to injury and thus infection, but they can't do anything good or useful. The same is true of dew claws on dogs. Once upon a time, the ancient ancestors of dogs looked more like modern raccoons. They were tree climbers with five-fingered hands capable of grasping and holding things. Dogs gave up that ability to specialize in high-speed endurance running, the trait that made them super predators. Likewise, emus too have this one remaining finger, and on the end of that finger is a sickle-shaped claw, a remnant of the claws of manoraptors, theropod dinosaurs like Velociraptor and Dromeciamimus, which looks an awful lot like an emu inside and out, hence the name. The thing about these is that emus don't have wings. They have tiny little arms, just like Tyrannosaurus. But emus don't have any muscularity left in their arm. So what, can, what use can a claw be in an arm that is itself only a vestige since it has lost the ability to move? Evolution explains that. Creationism can't. Osteology and osteogenesis reveal more vestigial features, like one of many examples I could list, is how modern horses still have the remnants of their second and fourth metacarpal, the fingers that they no longer have but that their ancestors did. They're still there, just the bones, hidden in the flesh. They don't serve the original function, they just reinforce that middle finger now. And once again, evolution explains facts that creationists cannot even admit. And humans have lots of vestigial traits. We'll cover some of them in upcoming episodes. For now, I'll just tell you that our fingernails are vestigial claws, now used more for dermatology or as tweezers. And what was a weapon is now used more for cleaning grit. That little lump of flesh in the inside corner of your eyes is a remnant of a third eyelid that was lost in other primates, except gorillas still have theirs. And we also have atavisms that count as vestigial. 
For example, the palmaris longus muscle that other primates use for hanging in trees, not all humans have that one. And likewise, only some people have enough auricular muscles left to move their ears like other monkeys can. And most other primates have a baculum, a tiny bone in the penis that helps keep it up. In chimpanzees, the bone is greatly reduced, barely a sliver left, as some chimps have lost theirs entirely, and a very few people have been born with that bone. So there's another vestige, and another fact that evolution explains that creationism can't. It should be pretty obvious that our body hair is vestigial too. We have the same number of follicles as the other apes do, but our hair doesn't grow as long or as thick as theirs anymore, and that makes goosebumps vestigial too. When you get cold, tiny muscles at the base of each of your hairs point the hair upward. And if those hairs still counted as fur, that increased fluffing would add to our insulation and help keep us warm. But that doesn't work in us anymore because our hair is too thin and wispy, usually. We also have genetic vestiges, like from ancestors who lived through viral infections. We have the genetic vestiges of those endogenous retroviruses retained in our genes innumerable generations later. At least a few of your ERVs are also an exact match for those found in apes and old world monkeys in both type and location. So they're not even possibly coincidental, but instead indicating a succession of common ancestors who suffered with these specific infections. We also share a number of genetic defects that are vestigial too. Like the granddaddy of all monkeys had a mutation that cost it the ability to synthesize vitamin C, which is why we have to eat citrus or else we suffer from a vitamin deficiency called scurvy. Humans have a number of other genes that are inoperable in us that were deactivated by mutation, but that still work in other primates. Why were we born with defective monkey genes that are broken and dysfunctional in humans, but that still work in other monkeys? How's that for intelligent design?